Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege to be in a city uh, that's considered to be the oldest, most continuously inhabited city in India, close to 3,000 years. And more ironically, talk about the future when, when standing in a place like this. Uh, and at the same time, I'm also a little bit worried from the events of last week. Predicting the future in general is not a very good uh, uh, you know, profession to have right now. But, but I'm confident that I think uh, we're really just talking about predicting the future for ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean the people in this room um, as engineering professionals, me being an engineer as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the future of work. Okay. Uh, this has always been an interesting topic for me. Um, we live in an absolutely unique era, uh, like absolutely nothing else. Um, and all of you uh, who, who are students of history will realize this. We, we realize that uh, mankind took almost till 1500 AD to kind of get to the Renaissance and about 17 or 1800 to get to the Industrial Revolution. And from the Industrial Revolution onwards, uh, the rate of change of technology has been so fantastic and so exponential uh, that we are on completely uncharted territory uh, right now. And the reason this is so is because when you think about the fact that there's 1.8 billion people on Facebook, and the platform doesn't matter, you know, there's a billion, close to a billion people on WhatsApp and so on, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is that at no point in history have human beings ever been disconnected with each other digitally. And that the average human being in the past never really knew more than 150 people and never traveled beyond 25 miles from the place of his birth and this was true till the 19th century. Right? And now you have, you, you have a moment where you can reach out to anyone. Right? Now, it's also estimated that more people own a mobile phone at this point than a toothbrush in the world. And it's, it's easy to laugh. What it actually says is that we are uniquely capable of realizing that a mobile phone provides more value uh, in this digital economy. Uh, than what we would consider to be a basic object of hygiene. So our assumptions about what's important, what's not, are all completely broken. Okay? Now, some interesting examples that I want to talk about. Okay. When Instagram, all of you have heard of Instagram, when Instagram was sold to Facebook in 2012 uh, for a billion dollars, right? in 2012, New York Times was valued at $946 million. Right? So essentially, an app built by about 25 kids for food photography and selfies was more valuable than the world's most respected newspaper. Right? Now, what it actually tells us is that there's this inflection point in exactly how we perceive society and how there is what we call a degradation of institutional power. Right? Whether good or bad is not something that we'll judge, but what it says is that the power to do journalism, the power to record what you see around has permanently shifted away from those with power, like the New York Times, to those with cell phones in their hands. Right? So that's essentially what this means. Now, when you think about the fact that today, a startup like BuzzFeed generates more page views than the New York Times, and forget this, in India, I would wager that more people, most of your relatives, get your news from WhatsApp forwards and less from the traditional mainstream media. We are now at an unprecedented level of distrust in any sort of mainstream sources, institutional sources of information. Right? So where we are going right now is the fact that when this happened, all of you are geeks here, so you would all know what this meant. Right? Gangnam style caused Google to actually change their data type for the, the view count from integer to long integer, uh, simply because it had crossed 2.1 billion views. Right? So what it also means is the fact that I grew up in an India where Doordarshan used to happen in the morning and then shut down and then resume in the evening, right? And now there's a hundred hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. There's no subject that you cannot learn. You do not have to be an IIT Patna to learn engineering. You can watch these, these the best professors in the world teach this over Coursera, over YouTube, over, over any one of these modes, right? So we're, we're now living at a time when kids are building iPhone apps, and I'm not kidding you. I learned iPhone programming from a channel by 11-year-old Ameri Indian-American kid who has more than a million views on YouTube, right? And that's where I learned iPhone programming from, right? So I didn't go to an expensive course or, or pay money for it. Right? So what's happening now is that we're also at a point of time when more people are taking Harvard MOOCs than actually attending Harvard. Uh, so, 
One last interesting point is that how many of you play video games here? Right? Some of you play video games. Um, and Fallout 4 uh, was this big video game uh, that came out uh, last year. Right? And just, just to put things in perspective, the Titanic made a billion dollars in, in its first decade. Right? That's box office, DVD sales, reruns on TVs and so on. Fallout 4 made $750 million in the first 24 hours of its launch. Right? And when you think about the fact that video games are built by small teams of 25, 30 people, think about this fact that 30, 30 people are able to build something that makes about $750 million in a year. So we live in completely non-linear economic times as well. It's, not, it's nothing like ever before. Right? No company could make a billion dollars in a day before because if you had to make some tangible good, it takes time and material and cost and people. Uh, apparently close to 3,000 people worked on making the Titanic. A small fraction of them worked on making this video game. Right? So what's also happening is that this is one of my favorite examples. Kickstarter, a crowdfunding platform. This is a famous example of somebody who managed to get close to 3,500 people to fund 30, almost to the tune of $37,000 for a bowl of potato salad. I am not kidding you. Right? Ten years ago, if you had to walk into a bank and say, look, I have a business plan, I'm going to make potato salad. Right? And I need $35,000, the security would kick you out. Right? But now, the interesting thing is, is that there is no democratization of your ideas being able to sort of being able to be funded in any which way you want, right? Although in this case, it was a nice stunt, you know, he turned it into charity. But what it actually says is that never before has the time for taking an idea and turning it into an actual product ever been shorter, right? You have an idea, you can 3D print it, you can go to Alibaba, find a Chinese supplier, get it manufactured, start selling it on any e-commerce platform. That's, that's the supply chain of, of, of the digital world we live in today. Okay? Now, this is one of the more important things that we need to keep in mind. That, uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is an Amazon warehouse. Okay? An Amazon warehouse that traditionally used to have human beings who used to go and pick up things from shelves, but apparently they now have robots. These are Kiva robots. And you know, most people think robots have to be like Terminator, very you know, anthropomorphic, and, and, and therefore they think that it's not likely to happen. No, actually these robots are just those small vacuum cleaner type things that carry entire shelves. Right? The reason this slide is really important, and I, I want you to keep this in mind, the design of this warehouse is actually now designed for the robots. It's not designed for human beings. In case you notice, the items in the warehouse are not exactly arranged in order that would make it easy for a human being to go pick up, oh, this is the electronic session, this is the Apple tablets, and I'm going to pick the iPad from there. No. Amazon actually says that since people tend to buy iPads all at the same time, so it makes sense that people, different people who buy the same object, they should be placed as far away as possible so that the robots don't get into a traffic jam uh, while going and getting it. Right? So think about this. This is designed simply by the brute force use of data. This is not something that human beings can ever think of doing. Right? So, so this is a very, very interesting world, and we will talk about it uh, as we go along. Okay? Now, can you just play this video? Now, as much as I'd like to be an AI optimist, I thought you know, it should be fun to take a look at this. Um, this is from uh, Berkeley. This is a multi-million dollar robot uh, that is capable of doing what you're about to see. What it actually does is that it, it is able to take things from a random bunch of clothes, uh, carefully look at it, uh, and fold it. Right? So what our average 10-year-old human being can do without thinking, this multi-million dollar robot is only now being able to, to do that. Right? So the reason I'm actually showing this slide is because our understanding of AI should not be that it's going to take away all our jobs, that it's going to replace, it's going to automate everything. Right? Uh, Professor Andrew McAfee says that with today's AI, it is easier to replace a half a million dollar salary investment banker than it is to replace a plumber. Right? So there are certain categories of things that human beings will always be better at doing. Apparently, folding clothes is one of them. Right? Um, so, and one of those things that human beings are bad at doing is driving. Okay. Uh, we kill more of ourselves with drunk driving than pretty much any other non-natural causes. 
Um, and this is and this is uh, this is now getting to be mainstream. Two years ago, I would not have believed uh, that self-driving cars would be a reality, but they very well are. There are self-driving Ubers in Pittsburgh. Uh, and here's the funny thing: technology has now gone so far ahead of of governments and you know regulation and the law that the self-driving Ubers need to have a driver who touches the steering. Uh, because the law requires a driver to touch the steering. He doesn't have to do anything because the car still drives itself, right? So, so that's where we are now, okay? So, and I want to give you a, an entertaining story uh, before we kind of get into the more serious business of, you know, where all of this is going for all of us in this room. Right? Uh, this is a story actually of a colleague um, who works in California, right? And, and for those of you who know California, uh, who, or who have watched a lot of Hollywood movies, there's a certain stereotype associated with California, right? which is very different. There's a different stereotype associated with Texas than you know, is with California. So the typical Bay Area person is someone who is into yoga, is into spirituality, eats vegan food, does not eat burgers. Uh, you know, so that's this typical Silicon Valley sort of mindset. And so this is a, this is a designer, there's a colleague of mine, um, who predictably enough is from California and has not eaten a burger for about seven or eight years. Okay. Um, and after a long trip, she decides that, you know what, I feel like eating a burger, right? So she goes to a McDonald's um, and orders a burger and pays with her credit card. And her card is declined. She being a designer, she calls the bank and says, what happened? I mean, I surely have money. Why did you decline my card? So they humored her. They told her um, that, that our fraud detection algorithm had profiled you not as someone who's likely to eat at a McDonald's. <laughs> and, and so, so that's it. But wait, wait, that's not enough. That's not the end of it. And they said that st statistically, patterns also tell us that when somebody steals a credit card, there's a very strong chance that the very first purchase they make is usually a burger at McDonald's. <laughs> so essentially, when, so here's the interesting thing. This is not the sort of pattern that a human being could have put together. This requires pretty much terabytes of data analysis that only algorithms are good at doing, right? So in this case, it was a hilarious sort of failure, but think about the number of fraud situations that it actually captures, right? So that's where we are. Um, but here is the, here's the bad news though. The bad news, the bad news is that today's professions and therefore education systems are absolutely not designed for today's work. Because our education systems are a product of the Industrial Revolution, are a product of, of an era where factories needed a lot of non-creative order takers, so we built schools, removed all artistic education from them, forced people to learn science and basics of maths and mathematics and accounting and so on, so that we could create a generation of factory employees, and we are still living with that system. Right? So when you think about it, our professions are not designed for today's world. And we are all on the verge of obsolescence. And the reason for that are the following things, right? We are expensive. Okay. So think about medical care, and we just saw the talk uh, before, right? Medical care is unaffordable in most parts of the world, right? Um, and we're very, very expensive. Engineers are expensive, lawyers are expensive, tax accountants are expensive, and so on. We're not scalable. We don't serve a significant chunk of the world. We serve only the urban middle class and above, right? So when you think about professionals in engineering and medicine and science and so on, we actually don't, we're not scalable at all. And we vastly overrate the value of our expertise. Right? And I'll give you a very classic example. Till 10 or 20 years back, people had to pay lots of money to get their taxes done. Okay? Uh, but it's only a matter of time when the internet came and people figured out that what do you need to do to file taxes? You need an expert system, a rule system, that is able to sort of derive, uh, design all of those in a database and ask you to fill forms and actually just, just get the taxes done, right? The, so in essence, software was able to replace what used to be a very bespoke, expensive, an auditor had to come to your home to do your taxes sort of thing, at least in the West, right? And it's going to start to happen, any, and this is going to happen to many industries, not just, you know, tax accounting, right? So I want to tell you, the story of what's called the grand bargain. Okay. The grand bargain essentially came about in the Middle Ages, right? When human beings living in large cities, in large civilizations, realized uh, that you cannot possibly know everything. Right? Uh, you cannot, for example, do brain surgery on yourself. 
right? It would be very risky to do so. Right? And you also don't want any random chap operating on your brain. Right? And, and also, and therefore what happened is that society organized itself into guilds and professional sort of societies. The guild of engineers, the guild of barbers, the guild of surgeons, and so on. Right? So when you think about this grand bargain, and that's really the world that we live in. Right? So what's happening now is that over the last six or seven hundred years, these guilds and professions that we live in, these systems that we live in, have all become problematic. The very first problem is that there's a tyranny of expertise, which is that most of the knowledge that we, that we tend to gain from here tends to be closed source knowledge. Whereas when you think about tech support, right, how many people just Google for a problem and there's somebody helping each other out as opposed to calling and waiting, you know, endlessly for a 1-800 or a toll-free number, right? So when you think about open source versus closed source knowledge, this is one of the things that's actually changing it. And once you open source knowledge, it becomes possible to scale the, the offering to a large group of people, right? And then there is the status quo bias, right? Most innovations in any industry come from the outside. We've never recognized it, right? Uh, the VHS tape, when it was invented, the movie industry said, this is the worst thing, we must ban it, right? And then again, they accepted it. Again, not learning from those mistakes, when MP3s came, the music industry said, no, digital downloads must be banned, we must absolutely not have digital downloads, but they, they had to lose out again, right? So, and there is also technology myopia. You saw all those technology trends. Very few industries really recognize that it applies to them. Most people think the most disruptive technology will affect all other industries, not my industry, right? So this is a very common thing. And, and the last one, which is, that there is something called the anthropomorphic AI fallacy, which is that we believe that AI has to work exactly like a human being for it to be effective. And here's the amazing thing. Most of the stunning breakthroughs in AI have been not as a result of AI working like the human brain, but in completely new ways, right? With deep learning and all these other things, it works in completely new ways, and that's the, that's the reason why we're able to make these breakthroughs, right? So, let's skip this. So what is the future of work? The future of work is about expertise being more distributed than you think, right? It's imagine the fact that your knowledge is now far more widely available, freely accessible. Somebody somewhere is watching a Coursera course and learning exactly what you're learning and can do whatever it is that you're doing, right? And realize that much of what we call professional expertise is automatable in the next few years, right? And the only way you can stay relevant is not by doing what's called narrow focus and specialization, but by doing something called continuous partial attention. It used to be called attention deficit. Now it's called continuous partial attention. You should actually be multidisciplinary at the intersection of art and science, at the intersection of design and engineering, right? And you must know how to work with AI, not compete with it, right? The smartest people in the future will be ones that will work smartly with AI. And the last one of all, remember that technology is disappearing. By disappearing, I mean it's getting smaller and smaller. You won't know where sensors are, right? And that completely changes many industries. And technology also results in dematerialization. Anything that used to be hardware is now software. Cloud computing, 3D printing, and so on. And the last but not the least, if you're in any industry that's a middleman, you will be disintermediated, right? So, thank you.